Welcome to our Voices in Montessori podcast, brought to you by the Greenspring Center for Lifelong Learning. Please subscribe to our podcast so that we can continue to support your important work. As Dr. Montessori said, an education capable of saving humanity is no small undertaking. We agree. So let's get to work. I'm Tamara Sheasley Vallis, and in today's episode, we're talking about using the language of reverence in our classrooms and school communities as a central part of Montessori practice. I am delighted to have with me today, Elizabeth Slade. Elizabeth has been a Montessori educator for 36 years. She worked in both Springfield Public Schools and Hartford Public Schools, building public Montessori programs, implementing systems to support all children through the Montessori early intervention and child study processes, and developing the art of Montessori coaching. For six years, she worked at the National Center for Montessori in the public sector, leading school startups, designing child study trainings, and bringing the Montessori coaching method to hundreds of schools across the country. Elizabeth has led a Montessori training residency, been a frequent presenter at regional and national Montessori conferences, and contributed to Montessori and non-Montessori publications. Elizabeth's book, Montessori in Action, Building Resilient Montessori Schools, was released in July of 2021. And her latest book, Momentum, Montessori, A Life in Motion, came out last year on Dr. Montessori's birthday. Elizabeth earned her AMI elementary diploma from the Washington Montessori Institute and her AMS Administrative Credential at the Center for Contemporary Montessori Studies. In addition, she has a Master of Fine Arts in Writing from Spalding University. Well, welcome, Elizabeth. We're so excited to have you here today. I've heard your name so many times over the years, and most recently heard I had two different people in the same week tell me to read your book. <laughs> and one of them in person, one of them on Zoom, and they said that your book Montessori in Action is just making such a difference for them and and really putting them in the position where they're like, I don't know where to start, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many good things in here to chew on. So I just want to say welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very grateful to be here. It's our pleasure. Absolutely. So we are talking about the language of reverence today. So let's Let's dig right in. Can you tell us what is language of reverence? Right. So it's um, basically combining the idea of language and the idea of reverence to recognize that um, we have a, a system in our Montessori classrooms of communicating with the highest degree of respect. Um, and that is for, for and with the child, for and with each other, and especially for and with ourselves. I think people have the most difficult time using a language of reverence when they're talking about themselves. Um, but just the idea that we're using respectful language all 100% of the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so how, talk about how that looks if you are a guide and you're have a child who is really struggling and you walk into the uh the kitchen for lunch and you're so frustrated like what do you mean by language reverence in that instance mm -hmm. well i mean that's wonderful to have a scenario because being in the classroom we have moments where we are um, brought to our edge right um and in our organization, we call them key children. So our key children are the children who hold the keys to our transformation. So they invite us to build our own skills and to develop as a, a Montessori educator. Um, and so when we've had a moment with a key child where we're feeling our edge and we're understanding I'm out of my comfort zone, um, I think it's a great time to walk into the kitchen <laughs> and make a cup of tea. Um, but we still want to think about the way that we are um, presenting what our experience is so that we're moving away from. So language of reverence sort of looks at two categories, the language of diminishment and the language of violence. Um, and 
we accidentally fall into language of diminishment, you know, too much of the time, especially around our key children, right? Where we'll say, you know, oh, she's so impulsive. She was really testing me. And gosh, she's so needy the way she, right? And so how could we replace some of those words by saying, oh, I was just working with Elizabeth. She's so instinctive um, and constantly like seeking clarification and finding out where the limits are. And I see that she is so connection seeking, right? That she's, you know, has bringing in all of these needs for connection and I am empty, <laughs> resource me, help me go back and be the best guide to Elizabeth I can possibly be. Um, so that our, what we're doing when we're talking about that, you know, key children in particular or anyone, it could be, it could be a partner, or, um, it could be a, somebody we work with, a colleague, but it's focused on being action and solution oriented, not dwelling on something in the past. So we're not stuck and looping in sort of a negative narrative about something. We're, we're looking for a, for a way forward. Um, and it's mostly a way forward in our own mind with ourselves um, that we're, you know, really looking and language is going to really help us be able to do that, right? Um, because language is the, the thing that guides our, our it, it shows our thoughts and it shows our beliefs, right? And so if we had a child that was hearing or overhearing that they were impulsive and testing us or needy or tension seeking or manipulative or giving me a hard time, any of those things or having a tantrum, right? Um, we're in identity formation business as Montessorians because we work with children from very young age um, all the way through, and we get a lot of hours and time with them. And so we're supporting who they think they are and who they will become through our every interaction with them. And so if our interaction has words of respect and offers them the dignity um, of their, their own humanity, um, it's really helping them to see where is where is their growing edge, right? Where is their piece that they need to work on? Maybe it's waiting. They need to work on being patient and waiting. That's something I've always, as an educator, been able to relate to, <laughs> right? It's how hard it is to wait. What are the things we could do, right? But being able to help them language what's going on rather than having sort of a surface judgment. Um, I think of behavior as communication. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's not separate. It's trying to tell you something. And so as Montessorians, we go back to our roots as scientists and observe what is it Elizabeth is trying to tell me? What is it I'm missing? What do I need to know? What are her unmet needs or lagging skills or obstacles? Um, and how can I support the, her next steps? Um, so that's a lot of the way that educators use language of reverence is to really shift their own narrative um, and enter into, hey, what are the, what are my next steps? I, I just have to tell you that ju you just gave us so much, just <laughs> even in that bit, that was just, there was so much to chew on there. And in terms that I had not heard before, like key children and resource me and, okay, so there, I have so many, so many ways we could go with this, but I just... I want to ask, what do you say to the the people who say, well, but Elizabeth, we also need to vent. We're, mm -hmm. you know, we're adults and we need a place to vent. So if I have to be using the language of reverence, I can't be venting. Hmm. It's sort of like people who say that I can't be expressive unless I'm using expletives or, or curse words. Right. Um, and, you know, there was that study that showed that families that used curse words, um, the language development of their very young children was diminished because all they're hearing when you, you know, you drop a, a hot tray of cookies on the floor is one word, one four letter word, as opposed to the children who are hearing, ah, I dropped the cookies. Oh, what a mistake. What should I do? Okay. Right. That's a whole lot, many more words. Right. 
Um, and so if we're really holding ourselves as educators and we're committed to our identities as educators, we understand that every moment is an educational moment for everyone. Um, so that's like one piece is like, what's my commitment to coming up with alternative language or replacement language? Um, and we can talk in a minute about like first steps, how do you get started with this? But once sort of I've committed to it, it's like enlisting the people around me. Hey, I'm using, I'm using language of reverence. You know, here's, here's my glossary and, you know, support me, right? Um, because it's not about not having your feelings and it's not about not saying what's true, right? What's true is I am being pushed to an edge in my relationship with Elizabeth. She is um, right there. And what I think is the most positive thing. So, you know, the idea of venting is that it's going to release something like it's, it's, uh, it's creating a vent and the steam can, can rise off. Right. And so we do want to be able to have that release. Um, and what is going to be helpful in the end, rather than just feeling like there, I just trashed someone. Right. I just, mm -hmm. you know, I just said, I just did a put down. I just, you know, um, used that language of diminishment. I diminished them and I raised myself back up. Montessori constantly reminds us to not be driven by our own ego, right? Um, she uses the word humility so frequently, right? And so when we're humble and we recognize that the children are our greatest teachers or really the people who activate us are our best teachers. It can be our partner, our spouse, whatever, right? they are teaching us something about ourselves, right? So the real work there in opening the vent and releasing the steam is to end up with something that is gonna not make that moment happen again. I don't wanna just be in this sort of like repeat cycle of having that negative interaction, you know, blowing off steam, then going right back in and activating the same Inter having the same interaction again, right? I'm, I'm now on a cyclical loop. I think this is one of the things that hurts school culture, right? That our school culture then is we're just looping around um, and that we've sort of, you know, demonized or separated ourselves from really the human beings that can teach us the absolute most, um, especially around grace, about how do we move in this work with grace? Um, so, I, I think there is a, a lot to your question about how do we how do we shift because our culture is a behaviorist culture. It is a culture based on punishments and rewards. And we are a constructivist method um, that is situated in a behaviorist culture in the United States and in traditional education that is coming from a, a behaviorist perspective um, where we have this idea that of what our job is as teacher, right? And that we're going to like give them consequences to stop them from ever doing that again. That's gonna be a deterrent, right? Or we can give them an incentive, a reward for doing that. That's not what we believe. That's not our method, right? The Montessori method is completely other than that. But our everyday interactions are with a behaviorist mindset, right? So our first task in language of reverence is to make that shift to, do we truly believe that everyone is in the process of self-constructing? They have what they need within them, right? And that I'm supporting and guiding their navigation through this by inviting them into learning things they, they don't know yet. This is, goes for all humans, not just children. Um, and if I re that's really my goal, then when I am at my edge, it's not about slamming or knocking down or punishing or, consequencing someone it's about i hear him in my edge <laughs> right what do i need to do what are the things that are self-soothing for me how do i find rational detachment in this moment um what are the things that help me um so that i can come back down when we're when we're that upset we're not in our frontal lobe and our thinking brain anymore we're in our amygdala right so where you know we want to be able to move from there back to back to our thinking brain um, in order to go back and do the good work we want to do. Nobody's in the classroom to feel like they're in a six, a cycle of failure with a with a student, right? Everybody's in there thinking, oh yeah, I'm I'm here to serve children. Um, yeah. 
I, I love that answer. I want you to know you have my word that I'm going to listen to this over and over and over until I all, I become one with your words. <laughs> and I think the piece that I, I also just want to add is that we think that we're venting and that we're not, it's not impacting the person who's listening, but we are always enrolling other people in our way of thinking, whether it be that the child is experiencing off-track behavior and you're looking for a solution, or they are so frustrating because they are, you know, I've heard people talk about a child being manipulative. We know that children do well if they can, that's not accurate, but we come in and it's very easy to leave the person we're, we're venting to with kind of this pile of whatever we've just given them, we're handing them something. And when we hand them that the child is wrong, then they're left holding that and having to either dismantle it themselves or mm -hmm. they have to, they hold that lens for that mm -hmm. child or that person, that adult or whoever we're talking about mm -hmm. moving forward. And that's something I try to remember myself, remind myself of really is what am I trying, what do I want to leave them with around mm -hmm. this person? Um, mm -hmm. and I'm responsible for that. We are all responsible for what we're leaving the other person with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, you mentioned the word manipulative and that in some ways, when we're not using language of reverence, we're not challenging ourselves to think more deeply about it. So we're sort of like using these general words that are, you know, um, judging the person. Um, but when we think about manipulative, we could be thinking about that as th these are the tools that this child has. Like, this is a winning strategy in their home or somewhere else. And these are the tools they have learned and they're using. So that might be one scenario. You know, another scenario might be they're very persuasive, right? This is by a future attorney, right? <laughs> um, and they, you know, it's we're in second plane of development. They need more opportunities to debate. They need more opportunities, right? So very different scenario. And then there might be a case where um, we're talking about a child that's trying to establish agency. Like I'm just trying to, I am a separate human being, you know, maybe I'm two. <laughs> I'm just trying to establish my own agency and I, um, that's where I'm at. So I think planes of development helps us understand it. But when we are using language of reverence, we are asking for more precision. And oftentimes when we're super frustrated, it's because we don't know. And then what do we need to do? Go back to our core practice of observation. Well, I need to observe more. I need to understand this child more deeply to know what, what is that behavior trying to tell us? What is it? What are they establishing here? Um, so that we're so we really truly are in that learning cycle of figuring out what it is. I think it's really important to have somebody like ongoing to have these conversations with. So a coach or a trusted person, right? Um, in Montessori coaching, we say everyone is coached and being coached because we're like in a Montessori classroom that's multi-age, right? And everyone in a Montessori classroom is coached and being coached every day. Um, and to have a coach in the school that you can go to because they're gonna hear those cycles and say, oh, this sounds just like when you were talking last week about so-and-so. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't even catch that because it really is about us. It isn't so much about the children, right? But we're not seeing those themes. I have a um, friend that I take a weekly walk with and we've done coaching back and forth for a decade. And she has all of those little pieces that she can catch back and say, oh yeah, it sounds connected too. And that's helpful for me to realize, oh, okay, yeah, right. Um, so we we need we do need that other person who's listening. And when you mentioned like it's having an impact on the per the listener as well as the speaker when it's just venting and it's just feels like negative, um, that it's a, a positive experience if the listener then realizes I have permission to invite this person to know themselves more in a way they don't know themselves yet. Everyone has their blind spots, right? We all I, I am amazed at the things that other people can pick up and sh shine back to me that oh, that's so hopeful. I, I, I hadn't seen that before. I didn't see that connection or I didn't understand that. 
Um, and so how are we able to support each other through the learnings that these amazing beings have for us every day? <laughs> mm. Well, what you're really calling on is you're, you're cycling back to Dr. Montessori's mandate that we do the spiritual work as of the adult. And Absolutely. that we, any time we're making somebody else wrong, we've stepped out of our own, I don't know, we've, I call it stepping out of the, you're out of the driver's seat and you're just a passenger while your ego <laughs> takes over and says, no, there, it didn't go my way. They're wrong. Mm -hmm. All those mm -hmm. things. And mm -hmm. our, that's our spiritual work. Mm -hmm. When the mm -hmm. child, when we're making the child wrong, when we're making the adult wrong, that's mm -hmm. our spiritual work. That doesn't mean we don't have boundaries. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Boundaries right. are very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And maybe we can get into that after if we have any time left. I'd love to talk to you more about some boundaries. Okay. So can you talk to us about how language of reverence really fits into the Montessori it, it, classroom, Montessori education overall. So, you know, Dr. Montessori talks a lot, particularly in Absorbent Mind, but all the way through to 1946 London lectures about children's ability to acquire only the words that they hear spoken around them. Like, right? And so the language of the next generation is being built in every moment in our Montessori classrooms because we work with very young children, um, right? And so even schools that start at, you know, with a, a standalone kindergarten program and move into elementary, um, again, we're still, you know, creating neural pathways um, in, in our mind about it. And so we will reflect the language that we hear, right? Um, and children, especially in, first plane are hungry to learn new words and put them right to work. Like, you know, it's always wonderful to hear a very small person say, um, that is spectacular. You know, like, wow, where did that come from? But like, they, right, they're drawn to the big. And so in our Montessori classrooms, what we say is repeated, just like, and we know this because part of the prepared environment is the prepared adult. We ourselves are a role model for how to navigate being in community. And so we're, we're that's being absorbed every minute in first plane and it's being watched and replicated um, in second and third plane. And so bringing that sense of um, dignity and respect for everyone um, fully supports our ability to create that unified Montessori community where there's no insiders and outsiders. There's no us and them, them thinking. Right. There's no sense of right way, wrong way, my way or the highway. Right. That where we ourselves are actively entering into this um, when we're showing respect. And we see the immediate effect that it has on classroom communities, especially on the um, esteem of our key children. Right. Because where does that fall? Where do we when we aren't using language of reverence, where do that those constant reminders or those constant pieces or those language of diminishment, where does that come out is focused on our key children. And now all the other children are completely picking up on that and we're developing an us and them, right? And so, you know, gosh, back in the, the late nineties, right? Where we were all required to write bullying policies, right? And uh, to be able to establish how do we respond? My question is always why are, how is this emerging anyway when our natural instinct is caring? Like when, when babies hear other babies cry in the supermarket, their heads are turning like, wait, is somebody taking care of them? I feel like that's, that's how we're wired is to care for each other, not to tear each other down. Um, and so can we take away the modeling of our culture um, and be different in the Montessori classroom? And instead of responding to something that in another world, somebody might have thought of as cheeky or off point is to say that is a very interesting question. I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. You know, can you write that in our class journal? Can we put that up on the board? Can we hold on to that? It's an amazing because our key children are a lot of times they're our neurodiverse, wild mind, leaders of the future world thinkers, right? And we want other children to see that respected and, and encouraged that people 
aren't just here to be compliant and do what the teacher says. They're here to be free thinkers, right? Um, and so how do we, do we deactivate the part of ourselves that needs to have a negative reaction um, and step into an embrace with it? Um, so I think language of reverence doesn't just fit into a Montessori classroom. I think it's an essential element of running a Montessori classroom is that we're not bringing our behaviorist thinking and our behaviorist language into a constructivist space. We're matching how we think and how we speak and how we act with the community that we're working so hard to build. I couldn't agree more. And I, it, so well said. And I, I think the way that I find it often can kind of come through for folks is if we think about how we hold the children and we would never allow the children to speak exactly without reverence for each other, right? We would, we would ask them to reframe it. We would ask them how they could maybe think about that differently and yet so often for ourselves, for the adults, the rules <laughs> apply. And it's okay. and so if we are, if our school, we hold the way we hold a Montessori classroom yes. with all the adults having to follow those same protocols, I really find that that's the, that's the key is yes. what would we ask the children to do? Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful doorway in because it sort of breaks down that say do gap like we say one thing, but we do something else like the guide is saying we don't call across the classroom right. Um, that's what children see all the time when we're using language of diminishment rather than language of reverence is you get to do that so when i'm big i'll get to call people whatever and say whatever but it's the rules in here rather than no, this is how we live. We live with the utmost respect for diverse perspectives. Um, and we are embracing of what other what everyone is bringing here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, so I'm sure you have some tools for us. Mm -hmm. Somebody is not using the language of reverence. You know, you're, you're standing in the kitchen and they're not using the language of reverence. What do you recommend? How do we, with our, with grace and courtesy uh, and respect and love, share with them that we care about them and we understand that they've, they're having, they're at, I love the term you use, uh, they're at their edge, I think is how you say it. Uh -huh. So can you talk to us about that a little bit? So I'm going to share a resource with you that you can post in the show notes for, for anyone who's listening to this. And the first task would be to share this with their whole school community, um, because what we want to have is shared language and a shared understanding of this journey before we start. All right. So people could listen to your podcast. They could use the the one pager to share it at a staff meeting. And you want that to happen before you're in the staff room or the kitchen with the person with smoke coming out of their ears, right? Because if they haven't already been introduced to this, that, that link is certainly not gonna happen when they're in amygdala hijack. They're gonna not be able to take that in, right? But we wanna bring them back online, back to their thinking brain. And so if they already know about language of reverence, oftentimes all people say in schools is, language of reverence, just even those, those that phrase like, oh, right, language of reverence. Okay, how would I say this? Um, and what's wonderful is um, one school told me that they've been using it and they've turned it into a verb that were like, oh, how would you language of reverence that? <laughs> right? That. Like, oh, I just, I said that, but what I really meant was, or I said that, how would I language of reverence that? And then the whole team will sort of crowdsource like, oh, well, you could say, or did you mean, and there's more questions. And then the person has a greater understanding even of what they were trying to say. So in the one pager resource is a sample glossary of sort of, this has been across many, many schools of educators coming up with replacement language. Because when we're trying to create a new neural pathway in our brain, sort of like learning a new language, um, we need to have some explicit pieces there. And so the glossary of shared language gives them some replacement language that they can use. There's a, um, a coach that worked in a Montessori public school 
who um, heard about this and immediately emailed everyone, the full staff, um, the glossary. And it was pretty small at that time. It's gotten much bigger. And we really always encourage people to email in and give suggestions of things they came up with. Um, but she emailed it out to her um, entire group. And she said that um, the next week when she walked down the hall, she heard so many pieces of replacement language that she was astonished, right? She, so people have been saying, oh, he's having another fit. He's having another tantrum. He's never, And the replacement language is having big feelings, right? And so um, just that she said, I couldn't believe how many times I heard adults saying big feelings. And then there was a staff meeting and we got to make a joke about it. Like, well, people might have big feelings about our upcoming professional development day, right? Like, so then it becomes shared. Now we really are a cohesive um, group working together towards the same goal that we have this kind of shared language. Um, so take the glossary, but you know, another great thing is even to start with a blank glossary. It's very simple. It has two sides was, what did we say? And is, what do we want to say? Right? So people can even start listening and you know, because you kind of feel a little piercing in your heart when you hear the word right? When you hear something said to someone or about someone um, and you feel that little piercing in your heart, you want to see what is what are the words in your community that are language of diminishment and language of violence? And then what would our what could our community replacement work be? Um, and so st starting with a glossary is great because it gives people a go at like, oh, I get the idea. But creating a tailored glossary for the community is really helpful so that we can sort take out words that have just become so um, familiar we don't even hear them. I remember years ago doing a professional development about um, the, you know, stepping into the constructivist method and simply trying to get rid of two words, good job, right? And how difficult it was when people kept being like, oh, you just said it again. It's like, I did not. Like, yeah, you did. That was your first response. Like, we don't even think of it, right? It just is what comes out of our mouth and working towards when you want to say good job, ask a question. And so that is going to be the same as your language of reverence correction time, which is that you're going to say good job, but then you're going to realize, oh, I just said good job. I'm supposed to do a question. How long did it take you to work on that? Or, oh, who did you make that with? Or, ooh, tell me about this part, right? Um, and then you got enough pathways in your brain that you, you have completely replaced good job with questions about whatever. And the same thing happens with language of diminishment, that you hear it and then you remember the replacement and you say it again with the correct word in, in place until your brain has it enough times that you're like, oh yeah, big feelings, big feelings. I'm, I'm having some big feelings over here. <laughs> right? I'm feeling a bit connection seeking at this meeting. <laughs> I'd like to connect about this topic. <laughs> and it gives us language. I mean, I hadn't really even thought about that until you just said that, Elizabeth, but it really gives us different language to use with ourselves. Because yeah. initially you said the people were, the person we're least likely to use language or reverence with is ourselves. I think that is very accurate. And what a gift to actually be able to have different words to use on, on with ourselves every day as we're navigating really challenging moments. Yes. Yes. Listening to your own self-talk is so important, right? And then your coach, your friends can hear you and say back to you language of reverence when you're like, oh, I did the stupidest thing. Oh, language of reverence. Oh, I'm, I made a I made a choice I won't make again, or, you know, I had a difficult thing happen or whatever it is that you aren't stupid and you would never say to a child, what a stupid thing you just did, right? And so how are we interrupting it? Those things that we don't even hear, but listening to your own self-talk is super, super important. When am I getting negative? And especially, you know, our, our whole method is built around friendliness with error, right? Where we are we know and understand that the brain learns by making mistakes. That's its number one way of learning is by doing it the, 
the, an inefficient way so that it can correct. Oh, not that way. Oh, this way. Oh, not that way. That cylinder block doesn't fit in there. It doesn't fit in there. I'm going to, right? I'm going to go until I find where it actually finds into. And then each time I do it, it's going to take me shorter and shorter amount of time to be able to make that correction. And we have a lot of grace as teachers watching a child do the do the cylinder blocks and not be able to get the cylinders in the right order the very first time out of the gate. We're not going to go and be like, what's wrong? You know, um, And how are we so hard on ourselves that we were supposed to do everything right the first time, right? And so how do we have some language of reverence with ourselves around grace of the first time? Well, that was the first time I did it. I would do it very differently next time. And then your coach can say, what would you do next time? And already you're off and running into something action oriented rather than the dwelling right? There is a whole piece of our brain that will loop um, around um, negativity. We're, we're actually wired with a negativity bias. That was part of our survival. We survived because we were able to relive past events that didn't go well um, over and over again. That is not helping us anymore, right? And so how do we interrupt that and say like, oh yeah, I'm just reliving it okay, I need to talk with somebody about what I would do differently, right? Where's the interruption? Um, and then to be able to have some, some grace to be able to honestly say, I wish I had handled that differently, right? I, I didn't bring my greatest dignity to that situation. And I'm coming out of it with this. So both and, we're not trying to say like, well, you know, I'm always great, I'm always good, or I'm, you know, uh, it's not about positive affirmations as much as honest talk with ourselves, it, well, what's true is it hurts. I, that was like, I don't know if you or your listeners know any Brene Brown, but she calls she calls it going face down in the arena, right? Where you you stumble, you fall, maybe it's in front of other people, but even in front of yourself when you don't handle a situation with a key child and they get even more escalated and you know it was the thing that you said that actually led to that escalation and you're carrying that, right? Um, and so you're having a face down in the arena moment where you're just like, mm. And, you know, Brene Brown's work is about how it's not that you're going to, that you went face down. It's how do you pick yourself up again? Right. Yes. So, right. That, that daring greatly is that I'm going to dare to stand up and, and own. This is what happened. Let's talk through what, what might have I said to that child in that moment that could have had a different outcome. Um, and that's how we're going to learn that key child. And that's how we're going to, that is why they're holding keys to our transformation. Now we have a whole treasure trove of new ways to support other children who come from that same situation um, and end up in that same situation. Um, so I, I think that's so brilliant. And it, part of what uh, Brene Brown talks about is the rising strong is actually the hardest part yes. of like getting back up and, and dusting ourselves off. We, we know the children can do it. How, how are we, how are we holding ourselves back from that? I think it's this focus that we have on perfection. And we say a lot around here, it's progress, not perfection. And so we have this opportunity to role model that. And mm -hmm. yet so often we get caught in our own head. I, I, um, I'm a pickleball player. I oh gosh, I am. And I'm a former pickleball player. I had a knee issue, but I'm hoping to get back. Love pickleball. <laughs> Love it. So fun. And one of the things that I listened to the inner game of tennis, trying to get my mental game better. And part of what they talked about was along these same lines, which is you've got these two brains and the one brain wants to take over and really criticize and coach, like always you should do it this way and all of that noise. And that that's actually getting in the way of our, our second, they, he calls it the second brain, but that other part of ourselves, that's really our higher self. I call it our spiritual nature. Um, because, but that first part wants to hold on. It's that ego part that wants to actually kind of enjoys making us wrong. Cause then we stew and it gets to run the show for us rather than us going into our, our spiritual selves and saying it's progress, not perfection. I don't have to be perfect. I am, I am taking the next right step and growing every day. And it's that growth mindset, right. That, you know, and, um, 
but one of the things that always comes up is people when they're playing pickleball they'll, they'll stop that they they miss a shot and they say oh you're so you're so stupid and i find myself telling them afterwards you let's be kind to ourselves the way we talk to ourselves impacts the rest and bringing this montessori language of reverence i mean it's not just in montessori right it's everywhere but yeah um it is amazing to me how culturally we're so it's we're so quick to be mean to ourselves and others. Yeah. 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 It's completely true. You know, one um, along those lines, one thought as people are starting out is to have someone in your mind that you're thinking of um, like, what would the Dalai Lama do? Or what would Dr. Montessori like for when you're in that moment, right. Of that elevated state is like, what would they think about this or say, right? And yeah, right? Like how can we call in and breathe in to the moment that we are in? Because we're talking about what comes out of our mouths under stress and duress, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like we're just sitting around having a cup of tea and this is coming up. We're in a fierce pickleball match or we're <laughs> in a, you know, what's now become a power struggle with a child, right? And we're maintaining a boundary of safety. And so things are escalating and our heart is racing, right? And so we're, we want to call in, who is that person? Who's that Montessorian or that maybe it was your, you know, somebody you student taught with, but like, who, who are you going to call in in this moment? Um, oh, just when I, just when I did that, I thought about a, um, when I was a young teacher, I worked with a primary guide named Linda Seeley. She was also a, an AMS trainer and she um, had been teaching for so many years and I was at the very beginning. And when I just said that, I like calling in is I, I would observe her in her classroom and she taught me so much because when things would happen, she would, she found it so dear. She would smile, right? She would smile and she would find it like, oh, you brought me the binomial cube we are looking for, right? And she would just, right? Like she wasn't reading in like, oh, they did this on purpose to upset me, to bother me. And it, I'm, it, it's taking too much time or whatever it is. She would, she just um, found everything so dear. And that often would help me as like, okay, if I could just smile, there is a lot of science that says turning up the corners of your mouth actually shifts your mood. Um, and so if we can, call in a person and think about, you know, what would they do or say, or like that person who's like, you've been known for deep breathing. Okay, that's a good idea. Um, because I do think it is part of our, our, um, the growth of our spiritual self, you know, we have our material skills that we're working on. And then we have our, the, the spiritual side of our development as well. Well, you're pointing to something that I think science is now demonstrating i think the philosophers have known this for a long time but our thoughts create our language and then our language creates our reality and it's one of these pieces with language of reverence that if we are doing the work of holding the child in high regard even when we're processing that we're frustrated or we're we can feel angry all of those pieces come up First of all, we love three deep breaths, right? Three deep breaths seems to make the world a better place at any given moment of any day. But you know what I just learned? I just learned physiological breath, which is when you are feeling like your stress level is really elevated and like you're starting to go is you do two quick in-breaths and it actually regrounds you in your body. And what's interesting is, I don't know if you've heard it, like a young child cry, but you can often hear them doing physiological breathing at the end. <gasps> well, as they're trying oh, to yes. like calm down again, right? Is that sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> right? And so like, we can just, we can do that as, as we're starting to feel like, oh, I'm leaving my body. Like I'm just, this is, I'm overwhelmed. And so we do physiological breathing and it regrounds us back in our body. <gasps> and I, that, I'm adding that to my, you know, set of things to do then I can do, then I can do box breathing or 3D breaths or whatever it is. But if I'm like, so leaving my body, uh, I can come back with those two quick breaths. Anyway, I just thought that was, I, I just learned that last week. I was like, oh, that's great. I love that. I've never heard that. I, I'm, I'm going to share that with everybody I know, because what a gift and it makes so much sense, right? Our bodies are designed. We're such brilliant 
creations. Mm -hmm. So, so just as far as the language of reverence, that our thoughts and the way us doing that work to hold the child dear, as you were talking about your colleague or, or hold them really with such a place of respect, even when they're not doing it the way we want them to do it, or it's hard and all of those pieces, it all can be true, but actually it shifts the way we see the child. Ultimately, it is not just what we're speaking. It's not just what we're leaving somebody else with, but it's actually changing the way we see them. Because as you said, it's forcing us to look for the why it's forcing us to acknowledge they do well if they can. And it's such a gift to ourselves as well as that other person. Mm -hmm, Because it's actually activating the relationship, right? That I'm connecting to you. I care about you. And so even if there's nothing said, that's felt in times of stress and distress, right? Is that I care about you. And what happens when we fall into language of diminishment is that we're separating it. This has nothing to do with me. And then the person in distress doesn't feel cared about, right? So you're breaking that relationship. Um, And so absolutely staying in, you actually came very close to a Gandhi quote about your thoughts create your your beliefs create your thoughts, your thoughts create your words, your words create your reality. Anyway, it's, I, I don't quite have it, but that, again, is along with the philosophers, has been a truism, right? And so our, if our, we can look at our words to go back and think, what, are, what am I thinking that's provoking that? And what is my belief, right? And has my belief jumped? Because I don't believe that children are bad, like that the word isn't even real, right? <laughs> I believe that children are human and children are constantly learning. That's my belief, right? So what's my thought about this child who's made this choice different than I was hoping, right? Or different than I expected. And then what will my words be? So we're almost like reclaiming our our beliefs and doing some rewiring out of how many of us, there aren't, there, it's, in every group I work with, there's always um, someone who was a Montessori child, which I love. Um, but many of us were not um, educated in Montessori classrooms. And so there is a little hiccup as we're, um, bringing in these new beliefs um, to our thoughts and our words. So I, I really appreciate that you've made that deeper connection into where does the language come from? Um, and somehow starting with the language, which is where it becomes more evident, helps us do that backwards work. I, I, I could not I could not agree more. And I think this is actually ultimately the foundation of our spiritual work as as Montessori adults. And it it oftentimes in our training programs, they say, okay, do your spiritual work, but they're not telling us what that spiritual work <laughs> actually yeah. is. And uh-huh. I think if Dr. Montessori had had more time, she would have spelled it out more for us. But now we know that our beliefs create our thoughts, as you said. And so one of the things that we talk about sometimes with our with our adults in our community is really standing porter at the door of your thought and really being vigilant about what you're letting in. And when that little seedling of, you know, of anger or even hate or um, disdain, right? Sometimes I see that there can be a disdain for a child who is making the classroom so much harder to operate. And and there's an, it's easy for those things to kind of come on and just take a little sprout and we actually have to pull them out right away. Mm-hmm. We have to really be vigilant about our our thinking. And mm-hmm. the language of reverence really supports us in that. The other thing I just wanted to talk to you about is, there's so much that I could talk to you about, but <laughs> the other piece I just want to think about right now is you, can I give you a few examples of things and then I know you're giving us a sheet, but for those people who are listening, Mm -hmm. you have a child who um, is, uh, let's say, going around and actually biting other toddlers at the toddler level. Very real, real life scenario, right? Mm -hmm. What's our language of reverence there? Well, you know, so now we're, we want to make sure our 
descriptive language is accurate. So if they're biting someone, that's what's happening. It's when we say, when we add a bunch of either adjectives or um, or adverbs to they're, they're viciously biting or they're they're you know so attention seeking they're going around biting everyone so it's the language around the biting so you know of course I'm sure the people in that classroom are thinking about why is Elizabeth going around and biting everyone right um, oh she must be teething she's in that age oh she might not know oh we've gone over this a number of times so it's very scenario driven but it's already bringing us back into what's driving this what is oh okay so maybe it's a need right to for teething and biting but maybe it's a lagging skill and she doesn't know how to connect yet oh she's an only child and it's been COVID so she hasn't actually gone to birthday parties or family events Okay, so this is like the beginning of development of social skills of how do you get involved or make start start a connection with somebody else, right? So, but we're automatically, and you see, that was just so many words, and I didn't have to think about is that language of reference or not? I'm just trying to unpack the actions that I'm seeing to understand what's happening inside the person who's doing those actions because. And I'm also, you said earlier, like coming back to the idea of boundaries, setting a limit where I'm saying, you know, oh, you know, Elizabeth, I can see that Tamara is crying because you bit her on the arm. That hurts. And we don't do that in our classroom. Our classroom is a safe place for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. What can we do? Let's go together and get the ice pack, right? So we're still clearly setting the limit. We're still letting children know. So it's not like they can just do whatever and we're sitting there observing and scratching our head thinking about how we're going to help <laughs> we're still in there directing and supporting um but the words we're using that other child is hearing yeah no one does that here that's not safe i don't feel good about that like all that language that was just used is affirming everybody in the room um which is another one of the the prepared adults role is to ensure that everyone feels a safe learning environment. Mm -hmm. And to teach another approach, right? And how do they, what do they do? Uh, um, sorry, okay. talks about the peaceful revolution, right? It doesn't have to be that the person gets punished or hit or bit back again, or that there's like a, a negative thing. It's, there is a peaceful revolution for everything. Peace, we will have a peaceful classroom. And here's the ways we're establishing it with the power of our words. Mm, I love that. Well, we don't have very much time together, but I would love for you to be able to talk to us a little bit about the language of violence. Yeah. I happen to hear you speak on this a little bit uh, previously, and I think it's so interesting how culturally this violent language has taken over. Would you speak to that a bit? Yeah, so when we think about being outside of language of reverence, there's sort of two categories. One is the language of diminishment, which we've spent a good bit talking about, which is when we're using negative words um, or describing behavior in a way that isn't um, offering dignity to the person we're speaking about ourselves or anyone else. Um, but the other thing that language of reverence holds is this idea of language of violence. That's um, Culturally in the United States, um, we have a lot of language of, of violence that's woven in that we don't even think about it. So if you're listening to this podcast, now that I've said this, it's your reticular activating system of your brain is going to start noticing, oh, that's like um, a little earlier, my brain caught one when I was talking about um, developing skills. And I almost said, that's another thing to have in your arsenal. Right. Oh, that's like language of violence. So immediately it's like, eh, throw that out, throw that out. But because we're in the culture that we're in and we're constantly fed these words, that's going to keep coming up. And we want to think, oh, I, I haven't actually thought of what's a good replacement word for arsenal. Um, and I just, you know, stumbling through on a podcast trying to think of one. I'm going to come up with one. So the next time that comes up, I'm seamlessly able to say it. Right. That's the idea is that we're noticing how many of our words are coming from war because, you know, the Montessori education is the greatest weapon for peace. We don't want to be using language of war all the time in our classrooms because, again, we are we're doing it from a an unconscious place. Um, so I was in a training once, and somebody 
uh, we were talking about key children, we were talking about getting triggered and um, triggering them. And they were like, uh, language of violence. I was like, oh, that is absolutely triggers are on guns, right? So now we use the word activate, right? So getting activated or activating. Um, it's, it's everywhere. It's even in things like, you know, oh, let's make a document with some bullet points, right? And so, okay, do we need bullets in this? You know, can we call them pop points? You know, can, can we say we need an itemized list? How might we say it instead? So going through as, our, as we're thinking and talking, and that's the other fun of what I was saying before of sharing it with your whole community is that everybody can start crowdsourcing what language of violence is in our school as well. The language of diminishment impacts children's identity formation and the language of violence impacts their greater sense of safety and security in society, right? And so we want, we want to work on both. Um, and so being able to catch those things as they're coming out of our mouths at, or, or each other's and say like, oh, great, what would be a good one? I love that we just um, did, a, we just acted out what I was just talking about. Oh, stable, right, a stable of new skills. So we're going to end this podcast with a stable of new skills that people can use to avoid language of violence and language of diminishment. I love that. That was perfect. That was absolutely perfect. And I will just share because um, somebody had pointed this out to Cassie Mackey, who also did a, a podcast for us, pointed this out to me five or six months ago. And I have to share with you, I could not believe how much of my language had violence in it. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, just talking about, oh, you did a good job. You were killing it, right? Yeah. Or, or um, that was dead right. Or, yeah. I mean, just... It just in all of these places, uh, it, it was incredible to start to pay attention. And we're, we're slowly bringing that to our staff community as a whole. And really, because we want to hold the space and really be conscious of what we're creating with our words. Mm -hmm. So, Elizabeth, I have to tell you, I have enjoyed having you here so much. I have learned so much from you today. I am so looking forward to reading your book. I will be listening to your podcast. I want you to know um, just you are just a wealth of expertise and knowledge and love and inspiration. And thank you. Thank you for spending time with us. We're, we're really, really grateful. Thank you. I'm grateful to leave with progress, not perfection. Um, <laughs> No, that's great. Thank you so much for that. It was wonderful conversation. Wonderful conversation. And to our listeners, thank you all for spending time with us today. You can take a look at our website at greenspringcenter.org to view the show notes from today's episode. Elizabeth's Language of Reverence Overview is included in those show notes page on our website. And we invite you to subscribe to our podcast and hear the latest episodes and to join in the conversation on Facebook and Instagram. The work you do is so important. I think it's the most important. Elizabeth, you just used a phrase that I love that that Montessori education is how we create peace on earth, I think is how you said it. I could not agree more. So thank you all for being in this work with us. We're here for you. Join us next time.